Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we'll talk about preventing animal abuse neglect with special guests. Janelle Dixon, President and CEO of the Animal Humane Society of Minnesota. Joelle Moore, President and CEO of the Charleston Animal Society in South Carolina. And Julie Klim, CEO of the Pennsylvania Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we all live close to animals. We love them, sometimes work with them. Yet animal cruelty cases happen more often than we can imagine, it, particularly neglect cases uh, go unreported. Uh, let's talk about the work that you do and why you do it. And let's start in Minnesota with you, Janelle. Uh, talk about how you got into this business and what, this, uh, what these organizations are dedicated to doing. Sure, thanks for having me. I've been in this field for 30 years. Um, sometimes I am embarrassed to say 30 years, but um, I got into it because of mission. I grew up with animals my whole life and um, I moved from uh, Silicon Valley to this, so big change. Um, our organization's mission is to engage the hearts, hands, and minds of the community to help animals. And it's really about elevating the value of animals and community and how they're treated. We have three humane agents. We cover the entire state of Minnesota. Uh, we have support staff. We have a community or a, a crisis response team that is made up of our veterinary and animal care people that support large scale cases. We have about 800 to 1,000 complaints that come in annually. Of those, many of them are neglect related and are, are really um, resolved through education and working directly with that individual about resources and things that they need to know that they just didn't have access to and weren't aware of. Maybe 20 to 40 of the cases elevate to being seizures, large volume cases that have anywhere from 20 to 200 animals in them related to cruelty. And um, that's where there's seizure and court procedures and things involved. So um, it's a whole array of things and it's been a part of our mission and our work for many, many years. And Joe, the difference between neglect and, and cruelty, cruelty requires an action. Neglect basically is inaction, right? And thanks Mark for having me on. And I'll just echo um, what Janelle was saying about education and outreach and, and cruelty, um, whether we categorize cruelty uh, or distinguish cruelty from neglect or, or we categorize cruelty into intentional or unintentional um, cruelty. Um, it was kind of semantics and everything, but just as Janelle was saying, um, probably, and I believe the percentages are right around 80%, 80 to 90% of what might be cruel conditions. And this, and when I, when I say cruel conditions, not that the folks are cruel, it's the conditions themselves are unintentional and the intervention is not um, punitive, not through law enforcement, the intervention, just as Janelle said, is through education and outreach um, and making resources available. That's, that's very, very important because so many folks across the country, whether it's in rural environments or in um, urban environments, cannot access um, or afford things such as veterinary care. Um, I mean, you know, we have um, neighborhoods and communities um, across America that don't even have a supermarket or a bank. And so, so sometimes that stimulates an environment or conditions to be cruel. And as Janelle said, most um, of these cruel situations or cruel conditions for animals are unintentional and can be resolved through education and outreach. Now, do you generally um, focus um, all of you on domesticated animals, uh, dogs, cats, uh, bunny rabbits, birds, those, uh, those types of animals? Uh, uh, Julie, when, when you look at your work, is that where most of your uh, effort goes? The majority of our effort, but um, the Pennsylvania SPCA has been around for over 153 years, so we um, Prevention of cruelty has kind of has been core to our mission from day one, and and we were founded with officers preventing cruelty to look after horses in the city of Philadelphia. Um, so to this day, we still rescue horses. We actually had a rescue last week of 187 animals that included sheep and ponies and horses and goats and and rabbits and birds and all of that. So do while dogs and cats and companion animals make up the the majority of our effort, we still each year. Um, 
do quite a lot of work uh, with with all sorts of animals and and reptiles and and you name it. We've 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 had a case involving it across Pennsylvania. Are you able to unpack um, an example like this? Perhaps this example, or if, or, or if another example is is better for for legal reasons, of what you find in these kinds of uh, very severe cases. Yeah, I mean, it really is for those types of cases involving large animals and farm animals and those types of things. We're not, we are not, um, we're sworn to uh, enforce the cruelty statutes in Pennsylvania. We have a 10 person team that covers 18 counties in the eastern part of Pennsylvania. And so um, we're not, you know, going after farm animals for the sake of, for commercial uh, you know, farm animals and all of that. So it's usually single family farms. Sometimes it's abandonments. Sometimes folks just economically can't take care of um, their their animals. Uh, it's it's mostly the, the neglect um, case. A lot of horses that, you know, that they couldn't afford a farrier and it gets out of control. Um, and a lot of hoarding situations and those types of things. So um, they can be really challenging. We keep a shelter out in one of our, we call it our, our country shelter out in where there's land or we can house these type of animals because inevitably they do get caught up in the court systems and the court systems can be very slow. And we've certainly seen that this year with, with COVID. I'm sure it's been the same in, in, in all states where the, the court systems have really slowed down and a lot of our remedies can fall through the civil courts and those have completely shut down in Pennsylvania. So when you're in that situation, you're stuck Kind of holding those animals that we seized in what we call protective custody. So we've had a lot of animals stay with us for longer than we would like because the owners wouldn't sign them over or they're out there in the wind and we can't even serve criminal case against them. So it's, it, can t it can get very complex very quickly. I would mention that education was key. A lot of people don't realize that that animals, let's let's talk about your reference to farriers. It's basically about the horse hooves, right? Um, people don't realize that animals need a certain type of exercise, a certain type of activities for health. So you can't just create a enclosed situation and have that animal become healthy. You'll see that, that health deteriorate. And you will also see uh, over time, uh, some really, really um, uh, tragic uh, circumstances arrive. Uh, Joe, when, when you find people who really just don't know, it's not that they can't afford, they just don't know, how do you approach that person in a way that, that prepares them for the education that they really ought to receive? I, I think the key is really adopting a guiding principle, and that is that you're not, we're not in the position to judge. We're in the position to facilitate um, a problem, an issue, a condition um, to a better level. Um, and, and, that, and that's really discipline to adopt that guiding principle, Mark. You know, just, just don't go in um, with judgment. Uh, go in with <clears throat> the, the um, energy to resolve the situation. And there may, and you know, it may be that the animal has not um, received veterinary needed veterinary care, um, and find out what those underlying issues are, and then to provide that. I think with you know more widespread um, services such as you know free clinics um, for veterinary care for basic veterinary care, um, animal organizations, and I believe um, the um, both Julian and Janelle um, have these types of programs as well. It's food banks, um, veterinary assistance with, financial assistance with veterinary bills, um, very much like that, those types of things. And to broadcast, message that, broadcast that across the community so that, so that folks know. And they also began a sort of a subliminal understanding of uh, an appropriate level of veterinary care as well. Um, there's something in the animal world, and I would, we may not have time to go into that, that we refer to as the five freedoms and, and perhaps the sixth freedom as well for animals. And this is um, for all animals, whether it's um, livestock or agricultural type of animals or um, companion animals, so to speak. And that is, um, and we said things such as a freedom would be a freedom from hunger or thirst or a freedom from pain, injury or disease. Um, and it goes through the five. And you know, folks on um, tuning in here can just Google five freedoms and that will come up. And, and that sort of a, uh, it captures um, what an animal needs to, to not just to survive, but to thrive. So Janelle, uh, then, then you have the cases where people just don't have the means anymore. 
Correct. Like they're, they're under financial distress. Um, how do you deal with, with that? Because there's, there's a whole issue of shame, um, but there's also the fact that no education can help if you cannot buy the feed or if you cannot house an animal um, if you're in circumstances where you you just don't have the wherewithal, how do you deal with that? So I think it depends on the particular situation. And I'm glad you made that distinction, Mark, because there's a lot of people who want to do the right thing and don't necessarily have the resources or access to do the right thing. In a situation where there's hoarding or large volumes of animals, we may work with that person to reduce their population. So help them understand that you maybe have the resources to care for one or two horses, not 25. Um, <clears throat> we also support hay banks, things like that, and castration clinics. Um, then for individual animals that are more family oriented, that's where we have support services that Joe mentioned. So we have uh, two veterinary hospitals where we provide heavily subsidized care. So someone can get their animals spayed or neutered for $25. They can get um, regular vaccinations. And we have a sliding fee scale where someone would pay little to, to $0 to get that support up to a you know, a uh, maybe 50% of market cost to get those services put in place and food banks and things like that. So helping them in dire emergency situations and then ways that we can help people access on an ongoing basis the things that they need for their pets. Um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, mention as relates to Julie's comments, it, another complicating factor in addressing all these situations is the fact that each state does it differently. So every state makes their own laws and regulations. And as an example, in our state, our officers don't have any um, legal authority. We have to work within the construct of um, existing um, police force, um, like the sheriff's department, et cetera where others do have law enforcement. Um, so it all varies uh, by state as, as well as the importance of working legislatively on a proactive basis versus just reactive with response teams. Louie, how do you interact with, uh, with the authorities? Do you have legal authority uh, over in Pennsylvania? We do. Our officers are sworn um, on a county by county basis, but they are in effect state police that only enforce the animal cruelty statutes in Pennsylvania. So they're, they're trained as up to our, our officers at the Pennsylvania SPCA take extra training. They're, they carry firearms. We, we get involved in a lot of, in the city of Philadelphia, there's still unfortunately dog fighting, cock fighting, a lot of those um, kinds of situations that dovetail with um, you know, other, other situations. So yeah, so we do have the legal authority. And thankfully, it, just a few years ago, the, the laws in Pennsylvania were, were amped up a little bit to maybe amp is the wrong word, but strengthened. We used to be really one of the, the, the worst states in the, in the country, given the volume of puppy mills and illegal breeders and those types of things that, that proliferated our state. Um, we had very poor laws to deal with those. And so now we've, we have some things to, to, to be able to, you know, take some of the, the bad actors out of the system and really then concentrate on helping folks as we've been talking about today that, that really just need help. And then it's really a, a crime of poverty or lack of access to care so that we can actually help them help their animals. You know, we just uh, finished a poll in which we said, have you witnessed abuse or neglect of animals? And 40% uh, said yes, 60% said no. But Julie's reference to puppy mills and so on, particularly with the proliferation of puppies now as people are coming out of uh, COVID, um, it, it strikes me that a lot of, um, of systematic uh, abuse and neglect is, is actually uh, not experienced by people. Um, we actually buy the puppies downstream and they all look happy and you know waggy tails and so on and so forth, but uh, a lot of that would be out of, out of sight. Joe, what is your experience there? In that well, well, many times, and um, you know, many times, Mark, <clears throat> when the um, when the customer, let's say, goes to a pet store that is not working with a local animal rescue type organization, um, the customer really doesn't know how the puppy came to the store, um, and that's where the problem sets in. You, you know, you really want to know, and, you, and we try to educate the community that you know when they do. 
we don't discourage buying from breeders, but go to the breeder and, the, and reputable breeders will be very proud to show you the environment that the puppy was born in, um, the father, the mother, how the living conditions and everything. So sometimes these large puppy mills or these large pet stores will bring in puppies from um, what could be puppy mills um, in other regions of the country. And there's, um, and of course you can create all kinds of videos um, depicting, you know, where the, um, deer and the antelope play and that type of thing, you know, and it's just not the case in, in so many cases. Um, and then what we see so many times is that um, the folks, the family has purchased this cute, adorable puppy um, from one of these large stores. And then, you know, 48 hours later or a couple of weeks later, conditions start to expose themselves and the puppy is very unhealthy um, because of the uh, the conditions it was brought in, up in. And there are a number of current lawsuits um, against, and in fact, I believe there's a class action suit as well against um, some of the larger commercial pet stores um, for that very reason. There's, there's a sense sometimes um, that has permeated this field that humane societies, um, uh, organizations like your, yours have a part of their operation, which really is about uh, euthanizing uh, strays, euthanizing older animals that with no owners. Uh, Janelle, could you comment on on uh, a bit about the the scope of your operations and um, the emphasis that you place on these different elements, including uh, the the issue of what do you do with strays that that come in? Mm -hmm. Uh, so we have three sheltering organizations and two public vet hospitals, and. Um, we take in and care for about 25,000 animals a year. We place about 95% of those animals. We consider our organization an open admission organization, which means that we care for all animals that need help and we support the people that need that help. We don't use no kill language because um, it's really been quite divisive in the industry historically. Could you and describe it, that a little bit? What what you mean by no kill language? Well, I think no kill to um, you know a non industry person means to them that no animals are being euthanized, and generally that's that's not the case. And there isn't any kind of overriding body that legislates or looks looks out for what that means and how those terms are used. Uh, originally, it was 80% of animals being live release was no kill. It's now at about 90%. And that's generally a more arbitrary um, setting that is uh, looked to be achieved by organizations across the country. So it, it just lends, uh, it's something that's even developed so far as to used to be no kill and open admission, and now it's kill and no kill. And kills quite divisive in terms of how that gets used and what that, uh, you know, kind of what allegations that implies towards the people who work in the industry and what their motivations are, which there's nobody who works in this field to euthanize or kill animals. So uh, we look at our euthanasia based on um, unhealthy and untreatable. So the animals that get euthanized at Animal Humane Society doesn't have to anything to do with whether they're stray or owner surrendered. It has to do with what is their um, physical and um, psychological condition. And is that a condition that can be treated or maintained with support of behavior or medical services or not? So are they a healthy and safe animal to be placed in the community? And I think that's generally something that people from any perspective in the industry share but the language tends to make it seem more um, headbutting. So um, when, you, when you look at your other operations, you have an education operation, you have um, a, uh, investiga a, 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 an investigation operation. Um, what other elements do you have, Jenna? We do training and behavior classes for the community. So we offer, well, Pre-COVID, <laughs> we would offer about 90 classes a week. So our philosophy is really very much about the human-animal bond and how do we support people in having, you know, um, productive, valued relationships with their pets because pets are family and people want that. So training and behavior, education. Uh, we have a significant in-house um, behavior program. We transport about 9,000 animals from other shelters around the country to provide life-saving services for them. Again, we have a real emphasis on our um, 
uh, public veterinary centers, and those are targeted at people who have low and limited resources. We have a food pantry, and we just um, are launching a um, housing transition support program for people that are experiencing eviction, and we're seeing that on the rise now with COVID and the um, end of some of the eviction moratoriums. So we have a very broad range of programs that we deliver in the community. And uh, that, that's interesting. So a food program and a transitional housing program. Joe, uh, Julie, do you have the same types of programs in your in your areas? I think it's um, a, you know sort of a comprehensive um, um, spectrum of programs and services. It's um, you know there's not one clear cut answer, and, and Janelle articulated it so well. Is it's a whole? It really is a holistic approach to this. And and if if I could, Mark, um, you know, we talk about education. Um, we kind of have focused on education of the pet owner or the animal guardian, let's say. Um, but there's some other facets of education. Um, one is education in terms of public policy. Um, our elected officials, the prosecutors, solicitors, of the animal control officers who need not only funding um, to do their jobs, but also the training necessary so that they can distinguish what is intentional or unintentional neglect or cruelty. Um, and lastly, sort of that third cornerstone of education, and Janelle mentioned this as well, is education with children. Um, we tend to refer to it as humane education, but it really is teaching um, the value of compassion using the tools that we have, which are animals, and then the kids learning compassion can translate that to each other and to their fellow humans. So, you know, we're not born with the value of compassion. We have to develop that compassion um, as a value. And so that's what I would say, sort of the three cornerstones of education is educating the um, animal guardians or the pet owners, educating the public policy, the folks that are um, required to um, move forward with public policy, um, animal control officers, judges, the courts, magistrates, that type of thing. And then also children and teaching them compassion. Um, and that kind of underscores what Janelle was describing as a holistic approach to animal cruelty. That's such an interesting point. Julie, do you, do you find that there's a connection between how we treat animals and how uh, we function in society, how we treat uh, others? Uh, in in society, and is that part of your whole approach in Pennsylvania? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, you know, there's, it's been studied that there's a demonstrated link between, you know, um, cruelty against animals and 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 cruelty, uh, you know, other offenses against people, and it's it really is a a community. Um, uh, approach, I think, as every as everyone has said. So yes, there is that link in the um, when you're talking legally and in criminal offenses, but but also I think it's incumbent upon all of us to really reach out to folks and, and, a, and that you know, we're an SPCA, SPCAs, people always get confused thinking all SPCAs are connected or under one big umbrella organization and we're all separate organization, but we take that prevention of cruelty part really seriously. And, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to create an environment where people and pets can mm -hmm. thrive together. And, um, and so, because really the vast, we like to believe, you know, the, there are bad actors in this world and we do our best to, to take those people out of the equation, but most people really love their pets and, and we don't wanna be prosecuting crimes of poverty. We, it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure we, we provide the services to keep you know, pets and family and homes. And I think we've all seen in this year with COVID being stuck in our homes, just how important our pets have been. And, and it's why so many people have sought to adopt and foster and get involved at unprecedented numbers um, in, in the animal welfare community, because um, there's, a, there's a mental health connection um, and there's so many positives for having an animal in the home. So we just completed uh, a poll um, in which we asked uh, people whether they knew where to report um, of cruelty to animals. And just to be clear, um, you, would, you would report to your organization, right? And, and there's no judgment. It's just basically uh, alerting uh, you. Uh, you would do an investigation and uh, you would try to handle um, the situation uh, sensitively without judgment. But if, a, if, a, uh, if an animal is being neglected or abused, you try through education and through intervention to prevent that. Uh, is that, is that correct? You're, people can just call the local uh, society and um, 
and they'll they'll help out, right? That's that's absolutely right. As Janelle mentioned, it's very it varies very greatly state to state and within each state. But on in our we have a cruelty hotline that anyone can call. Um, sometimes people will still reach out to the local to the local police and they will call us. We work with state agencies here in Pennsylvania under the Department of Agriculture. There's a dog law organization that goes that licenses kennels and things like that. So there's a variety of ways. But yes, we have a, a, a cruelty hotline. We'll get we'll probably get between over three, four thousand calls or reports of cruelty per month here in, at our organization. And um, but you're right, it's it's it's. It, it's no judgment. We don't lead with assuming the worst. And you, we have pet retention programs when our officers come to a home and maybe a neighbor has reported an animal doesn't look so great. And they'll find that sometimes there's a, it's a, the, the person is elderly or ill and they just couldn't get out of the house to help their animals and they didn't have family to help them. So we have a community um, group that will then go in and, and support them and take them to one of our clinics and get them subsidized care for their animals and help them in their home. And sometimes there's a flea infestation and we'll go in and bomb the home and, and just provide that support and tell them how they can get that going forward. So, but Great yeah, you can call thank, thank you so much. And we're coming to the end of our time. So I'm gonna give uh, Janelle and then Joe, Joe will have the last word. Uh, we just completed a, uh, a, another poll. Would you favor adopting an animal of unknown pedigree as a pet or working animal, or do you favor buying directly from pet stores or breeders? And 92% uh, of respondents said, uh, you know, un unknown pedigree is fine. Uh, we would uh, adopt. Janelle, could you talk a little bit about uh, your adoption programs? Sure. <clears throat> we have an open adoption program, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, we changed that from a kind of very uh, traditional to a, a um, interactive program that's really built on relationship building with people. We don't use adoption applications or anything like that. It's really a one-on-one -on -one conversation that supports people in um, identifying the animal that's best for them in their home and helping them facilitate that. The whole idea of animals from shelters has really evolved. As I said, I've been in this field for 30 years. When I first started, um, <clears throat> animals from shelters were looked at as damaged goods, whether that was health or behavior. And the whole concept of rescuing a pet has changed dramatically um, in my time in this field. And now it's a badge of honor to have rescued an animal from an organization. And people love the story that they tell about their pet. And that change of mindset has really helped to um, support the ability of shelters to place animals in the community and have them find homes. And so we really try to take a very objective, non-judgmental approach. And again, moving that from transactional to relational and focus on the customer. And historically, organizations in animal welfare haven't been very good about um, trusting and liking people. It's been about the animal and it's very much about the people. I would say it's more about the people because we are the people, as people are the ones who are deciding what happens for animals, what impacts there are on their daily lives. And the more that we can engage people in thinking about animals as parts of our family and how we care for them, better off animals are. And Joe, as, as you see us uh, off uh, in today's <laughs> program, uh, what, what thought would you leave us with in terms of, of human animal interactions, uh, what the effect is of of humane treatment and, and integration within society of these animals that we call our pets and our support. Um, how important is this for our human health? Uh, you know, Mark, it's, um, you know, sometimes these animals, and I would even argue most of the time, the, these wonderful creatures um, have the key to unlock our potential. And um, it may be the cat that has that perfect purr for us and unlocks, you know, our capacity to express love to not only our animals, but to each other, or the dog that um, just snuggles up to you um, as well and unlocks our personal potential um, to express, you know, ourselves and our compassion, not only to our animals, but to each other. Um, and, and I think, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure Julie and Janelle would agree with me that animals help us grow as human beings um, extraordinarily. Uh, and, you know, and for, and for folks that may not um, feel that the, 
animal in the shelter is for them and, and they are really focused on a specific breed of animal or size of animal, um, that's fine. What I, would, what I would encourage them to do then is to um, ensure that you can see the conditions that the dog or cat that you're going to buy were um, bred in, born in. Um, you can see the mother and the father um, in those conditions. And, and if you choose to do that, that's fine, um, but also make a check out to your local animal shelter as well. And then, um, and then you can, it's a win-win situation. Well, given what animals give to us, it's, it's the least we can do to take care of them. Janelle Dixon, President and CEO of the uh, Animal Humane Society of Minnesota, Joe Elmore, President and CEO of the Charleston Animal Society in South Carolina, and Julie Klim, CEO of the Pennsylvania Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Thank you so much for sharing your insights uh, to us attendees. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your questions. If you take a look on our webinar um, registration page, you'll see a whole month of, of uh, coverage on the importance of libraries on Thursday, education for Latino uh, youth and, and the college track um, will be uh, next Tuesday, celebrating senior Americans, women in tech, PBS, AIDS, sex education, all will be covered in the course of, of May. Um, have a great day, everybody mask up, and thank you so much. Thank you, thank you guests for sharing your wisdom with us. <laughs>